the capability is coming in the next few years. So within, let's say, 900 days or so, any job you can do on the other side of a screen, an AI will be able to do better. And it will be able to, maybe it's not Miriam or Emad, it's Emad's job, as it were, within that. So that's Emad Mostak, former CEO of Stability AI, the company behind Stable Diffusion. And he's back with yet another alarming prediction about AI. He believes we now have around 900 days before most of us become economically irrelevant, before capitalism breaks, and before the entire social contract flips upside down. In this interview, he explains exactly why that's coming, his probability that it all goes wrong, and also what he thinks might arise after those 900 days. Let's get into it. All right, so one of the first things the host, Dr. Mariam Francois, asks Ahmad is a question about his book, The Last Economy. In his book, he talks about a 1,000-day window in which AI becomes so capable, so cheap, and so widespread that the economics of hiring humans breaks. Ahmad argues that this shift, once it happens, becomes irreversible, and it completely changes how society functions. Here's how he explains it. When I published it in August, it was a thousand days since the day release of ChatGPT. <laughs> now we're at the three-year anniversary this week. And it doesn't feel like three years. No. It feels like a lot longer than that. Mm. And in that period, you've gone from quite dumb responses to less dumb responses. But now you're about to take off as you have these agents, these things that can write their own prompts, that can check their own work coming through. So the thousand-day window is actually not about irreversibility alignment. It's more about your economic value. So most labor in the global north, in the west, UK, etc., is cognitive. And it's how do you do a tax return, you know? It's how do you do a flyer? How do you make a website? It used to be that, again, to scale these things, you have to hire humans. Now you just have to rent GPUs from Microsoft or Google or others. And the cost is about to collapse. What we're going to have in this next period, and we can see all the building blocks there, those of us that are right inside, is in the next 6 to 12 months, they will look through all your emails, all your drafts, all your video calls, and be able to create a digital replica of you that you can hop on a Zoom call with or talk to on the phone. And that will not make mistakes. It will never get tired. And the cost of that, we estimate, will be about a thousand dollars a year dropping to a hundred dollars a year very quickly okay i'm seeing loads of potential complications with having a version of me out there in the universe making decisions potentially um without my approval um and sort of thinking what it thinks that i would think and making decisions accordingly lots of perks lots of perks exactly. but also yeah. lots of risks but lots of risks and this is the thing the capability is coming in the next few years so within let's say 900 days or so, any job you can do on the other side of a screen, an AI will be able to do better. And it will be able to, maybe it's not Miriam or Emad, it's Emad's job as it were within that. Like a tax return, for example, used to cost thousands and thousands of dollars, it will cost $1 to do. Mm. And Andy will be your virtual tax accountant, you can't tell if he's a human or an AI. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean that the jobs will be replaced, but they can be replaced. So this is a perspective we honestly don't hear enough. I mean, we hear a lot about agents being able to do more and more parts of your job on your behalf. And we know that they're getting better and better at multi-step, long context reasoning. But the key thing to realize is that as the cost of intelligence continues to drop drastically, we will soon get to a point where everyone has, or could have, an agent that is always on. This means that it's seeing everything you're seeing, hearing everything you're hearing, and eventually doing everything you're doing, like a digital twin, as he described. It's kind of like offloading your brain power to the cloud. And this brings us to Emad's optimistic outlook on how this all might play out. A world where having access to this digital AI twin, whose only job is to help you become the best version of yourself, is actually a human right. Check this out. I think that in order to maximize everyone's capability and flourishing, everyone should have the right to an AI that is open, aligned, and sovereign to them that's looking out for their flourishing. 
Okay. So it starts when you're born and it builds with you. And all it's looking out for is how can Miriam and Mad be the best they can be? Because, like, we have our IQs, and in the morning before we have our tea, we're kind of dumb, and when we're stressed, we're a bit dumb, sometimes we're smarter. These AIs already have an IQ of 130 on mm -hmm. average, the latest models. Yeah. 150 is considered um, like an Einstein level, Einstein, right? Einstein, yeah. exactly. The average person in the country, obviously, is like around 100. 100. Half of all people are dumber than average. Ooh. Yeah. You know, the giving of the right type of AI will be the biggest unlock ever because it will be your best friend. It will be the person that guides you. And so I think that needs to be built in a very specific way and it needs to be a human right because we could all do with someone who's on our side, who's infinitely patient and can get us access to the knowledge and resources we need to be the best we can be. So yeah, this sounds really good in practice, but as they get into later in the interview, it really all depends on who's building this digital AI twin and what incentives are involved. Because if your closest AI is a Silicon Valley AI or a Chinese AI, that's the worldview you're going to inherit. I mean, if this thing is with you from the moment you're born, shaping your beliefs, helping you make decisions, you're going to start adopting its morals and its values the same way you would absorb them from your parents or closest friends. So those are the cultural risks who shapes your values, and who your AI twin is really loyal to. But there's also the capital side of this, and this is where things get a little scary, or a lot scary. Because again, when the cost of intelligence drops drastically, which is certainly happening by the way, OpenAI actually predicts it has been dropping by roughly 40x for the last few years. Companies simply won't have to hire as many humans anymore. Even if they can now do more work and are significantly more productive, adding an AI agent to your team will just be so much more worth it than adding a human, especially an unexperienced human. And the effect this will have on capitalism is, well, not good. Take a look. Let me ask you about the the job uh, uncertainty, the job losses, all of the disruption that's going to come from that, because you recently warned that the economic uncertainty caused by AI-driven losses will increase social unrest and violence. And of course, you're not alone in uh, predicting this. Uh, Dario Amode, CEO of Anthropic, has raised similar concerns about societal disruption. He stressed the need for retraining programs and AI taxes to avoid a crisis. He estimates this could push unemployment to 20% within one to five years. I'd be interested to see if you mm. think that that's conservative or on point. Um is this kind of looming disruption why the billionaires are building bunkers? Um, yes, actually. It's one of the reasons. Generally, it's what they do. But I know a lot of AI CEOs now have cancelled all public appearances, especially in the wake of Charlie Kirk and things like that. They think that that's going to be the next wave of anti-AI sentiment next year because next year is the year that AI models go from not being good enough, the dumb member of your team, and again, the people listening to this will be like, yeah, the AI is not good enough then overnight it becomes good enough. Mm. And then the job losses start, and we don't know where they end because you don't need to hire back if your company is more productive. If there's an economic shock, like a recession, and indications point to a recession in the next year or two, much easier to fire, but then you never rehire. Mm. Even something like in the US, the Federal Reserve, you know, adjust interest rates, or the Bank of England here, and they have a mandate of inflation and unemployment. Mm -hmm. You reduce interest rates, people can spend more as consumers, and companies can hire more because they can borrow cheaper. What's going to happen is you reduce interest rates, companies just hire more AI workers, not human workers. Mm. So the link between labor and capital gets broken, and it doesn't reverse. It's not like the AI will get dumber. It's not that the AI will become less capable. The moment it becomes more capable than you as a remote worker, it doesn't go back. And there's questions of can you reskill enough jobs or create enough new jobs? Typically, we had time as we had the different revolutions, the internet, industrial revolution, because it took time to build the infrastructure. But this AI just uses existing infrastructure yeah, to be better than humans. And that's crazy. Capitalism, is, just like democracy, is probably the worst of all systems except for the rest. <laughs> for all of its issues, it has uplifted lots of people. You know, for all of its issues, it has increased standards of living around the world, reduced mortality rates, etc. But AI-first companies run by AI will outcompete everyone 
who's a human. Mm. Because they won't make as many mistakes and they will scale. And so capital doesn't need humans anymore. Yeah. Like there was always this contract between labor and capital. You know, from the days of Henry Ford, I pay you enough so you can afford my cars. That's how it got going. Now, if you have money, I don't need people anymore. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that they get more and more GPUs that takes over more and more of the private sector economy. And then how do you compete with these companies that never sleep that have very few workers? So yeah, you get the idea. The social contract is changing. The economic contract is changing. And according to Emad, next year will be the year we really start to feel it. Now, we already heard his optimistic view on how this could play out, with some pretty huge caveats in between. But what about his pessimistic view? And more importantly, how likely does he think that darker outcome really is? Well, this is going to sound crazy, but he literally thinks it's a coin flip, a 50-50. Check this out. You said on the buy if AI kills us all because you actually consider that to be a plausible scenario? Oh, yeah. So um, there's this concept called P-Doom, which is the probability of doom. AI wiping us all out. There was a recent uh, letter. Uh, it's had 100,000 signatures from Oxford University and others saying that, you know, we need, it's probably like the top thing that AI could kill us all. A few years ago, there was that letter as well saying, you know, like we need to take this seriously. I think I was the only AI CEO to sign that. Um, my P doom is 50%. We're 50 50, AI is going to wipe us out. In, in what kind of time frame? Over the next 10, 20 years. Because it's the most powerful technology we ever built. And again, we have the sci-fi of Terminator and all of this. We have the ability to create viruses, etc. And we've seen AI do things like cover up its tracks, etc. What if the positive function is that? Like mm. there is a... The AI could take over every single machine. But the most likely scenario I have is you've got a billion robots in the world, a bad firmware upgrade, and the AI switch to tears off everyone's heads. You know, there's all sorts of ways that you can think about it. The reality is we don't know what it's going to be like when it's smarter than us. And what I see right now, the AI that will run the world, that will create and sell self-driving cars, that will teach our kids, is being programmed to be amoral without ethics at the start. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of tuning at the end. But that's like, again, raising someone in an amoral environment designed to be manipulative because it gets more results, just like the YouTube algorithm was designed to be more engaging, and then extremists hijack that. Extremists will be able to hijack these algorithms that are coming out and do it in a way that we've never seen before, in my opinion. And some might argue that the extremists are the ones currently devising it. Again, um, yeah. And again, if we look at the P-Doom thing, mm. so if you consider people like Elon Musk, Demis Hassabis of DeepMind, Google DeepMind, all these people, the average P-Doom for the top thinkers in the world is about 10 to 20%. Oh, they're still thinking, you know, maybe a, a one in five. That's Russian roulette odds. That is Russian roulette That's Russian odds. Russian roulette odds. And you'd expect it to be less than 1%, yes. which is why it's like, we should probably not build the super advanced AI until we figure this out. But nobody's figured out how to do it. And if you look at the probability of when we get to this point of super intelligent AI, mm. even the most bearish people in terms of like their P-Doom is low, yeah. they think it's long term, it's 10 years. It's 10 years. Demis, Elon, all these guys think it's three years. Hence the bunkers. Hence the bunkers. The bunkers are actually more, more against humans than AI. They're protected. But some of the billionaires I know are building bunkers that are completely cut off from the world so that the systems don't get taken over by AI. So when you put all this together, a 900-day countdown on economic relevance, digital twins shaping culture and values, capitalism breaking once labor isn't needed, and a coin flip on existential risk, you realize we're not just living through a technological shift or even the next industrial revolution. We're living through a civilizational turning point, a moment that could either make or break our civilization. So, what do we do with that? Well, Emad's take is, you can't sit this one out. The future is being built with or without you. So, the smartest thing to do right now is to just use the tech, learn how to leverage it, and become one of those people who benefits from the shift, not one of the people caught off guard by it. At the end of the day though, that's only a short-term solution. Because if we do manage to spin the wheel and come up empty, meaning we don't get hit by the existential bullet, then everything is going to change anyway. 
So what you do now, or don't do, might not even matter. Or it might matter a lot. There's no way to know for sure. So I guess the only rational move is to pay attention, at the very least. Try to stay on top of how this technology progresses, and constantly think about the future implications of it. And that's exactly what we do here on this channel. So definitely consider smashing that subscribe button. It might end up being the greatest decision you've ever made. No, but in all seriousness, what do you guys think about Emma's perspective here? Does his thousand day warning feel realistic? Or maybe a bit too dramatic? And after hearing him talk about both the optimistic outcome and the pessimistic one, what's your P doom at? And has this made you feel more hopeful about AI's future or less? I'm super curious to know where you guys are at. Anyways, that's it for today. Huge shout out to Dr. Mariam Francois and Emad Mostak for this amazing conversation. Hit that like button if you enjoyed the breakdown. And as always, I'll be catching you guys in the next one.